Well, growing up, um, I had a blended family. Uh, my mom was Catholic, my dad was Baptist. Um, my, gra my grandmother that we lived beside was very um, spiritual lady. She didn't miss a Sunday. She was involved in church. Always chastised us if we didn't make it to church. And uh, had a great influence from her growing up. And then we moved away uh, about an hour to Middleton, Tennessee. And um, so I was a good kid. I was respectful. I was raised to say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. And uh, don't do bad. You can do bad at school. You get a whooping when you get home. And uh, yes, ma'am, and thank you. And so growing up, I was a good kid. I wasn't a bad kid. I wasn't disrespectful. I aggravated the fool out of my two little brothers, which I feel guilty for today. But uh, I was just a normal kid. Uh, enjoyed hunting and fishing and riding four-wheelers and um, got invited to vacation Bible school in Middleton, Tennessee. So my mom's Catholic, my dad's Baptist. They always had arguments about the Bible and what the Bible said and how we're supposed to live. So we didn't go to church. We were drip, dropped off at church and then they would pick us up after church was over. So I had a good friend and he was different than all my friends. My other friends cursed and they smoked cigarettes and drank beer if they could at 10, 11 years old. And this friend was different. He was always respectful and always it was something different about him. So he invited me to church and I went to church and um, we were during a vacation Bible school. He, uh, the teacher asked and was telling us about Jesus and what Jesus meant, what Jesus did and the gospel. And um, I was blown away because I had heard it all my life, but it didn't sink in that I don't have Jesus and I need Jesus. I was the baby of uh, five, and so I got away with murder. There were three sisters, and then my brother, and then six years later, I came along. And so he picked on me a good bit. And then I got into playing sports and had a lot of friends, didn't really have a lot of connection with my siblings. Um, my parents were extremely good, moral people. My dad was from Coldwater, so good old country boy. My mom was an immigrant from Latvia. So we always got kid, um, well, the kids would kid me at the ball games and stuff that she would wear dresses and pantyhose and heels to our softball games. And uh, it never bothered me. I just thought it was kind of funny and unique when the other moms had on ball shorts and shirts and all that. But growing up, I'd never heard anything about the gospel. Never knew what Christmas was, Easter was, anything like that. And I remember distinctly being maybe seven or eight years old, something like that, my grandmother gave me this little book and it had the prettiest pictures on it. And she said, read this little book every day. And that's all she said. And uh, it was a New Testament and I kept it and I still have it, but uh, I never did read it. I just kept it because it was pretty. And so that sort of religion that you come used to in the South was not present in my home. And to live and grow up in the middle of South Haven, you would have thought that I would have heard about the Bible or Jesus or God, but he was totally absent in our lives. So I was a 17 year old young man, uh, determined not to ever get married. Um, I'm going to school, going to Mississippi State. I've got my life planned out. I'm gonna go to engineering school. I'm gonna build roads and bridges and civil engineer, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer. I just wanna do engineering, build stuff and make stuff. Had my mind made up and um, my cousin played softball in the summer. And so on the weekends, I'd go watch her play ball. We were real close growing up. And she was a tomboy. She played football and she played run through the woods and road four-wheelers and so she she said you need to come watch me play ball so i go with her to watch the ball game and then i meet suzanne well this girl's just a happy-go-lucky uh kind of goofy but um i don't know what to say i don't know how to say it anyway met this girl that I was a leader in our youth group. I was one of the most spiritual young men in our group, so I had to help lead our group, and then it would be the youth minister we work with. And all the girls that I knew that age, I was like, I didn't want to have no part of those those girls. And uh, they were great girls, but they didn't, I don't know, they just didn't have what she had. When I met her, and um, she had recently gotten saved, and she could talk to the wall about Jesus Christ. And when I found that out, it just blew me away. I never met a girl 
who was so on fire for the Lord, because I was somewhat on fire for the Lord, but not as on fire as she was, and she could tell anybody about Jesus. So when I met her, it's just it was the girl for me. I knew I'm, I'm gonna be marrying this girl. So I went from saying I'm never getting married, having five thousand dollars saved up of my own hard work and money to go pay for college, going to college, getting an education. I met her, and the Lord had better plans. He did, and when I met you and I saw you, you stood, you stood out. And what you were wearing was the first thing I remember. And that may sound really weird, but now people are into boots and tight jeans. But he was wearing these shorty shorts and this shirt. And he had on these socks that were real thick. And uh, normally I would have said, what is this guy doing? What is he looking John like? John McEnroe. No, it wasn't that. So. Anyway, so for whatever reason, God turned my heart towards him, and that was it. I saw him and never thought about anybody else. It was him from the start. And we've had all kinds of problems and issues, and we dated, um, and we were both Christian, and we would go to Christian band um, concerts and stuff like that, and youth, youth conferences and everything, but... We ended up putting ourselves in bad situations at times and not going out with other couples and uh, spending too much time alone and one thing led to another and led to another and uh, before we knew it we were getting married before we, we would have wished we would have and, um, and it was a re direct result from our decisions and our choices that we had made poorly. And where God has used that for good, and we've been able to help other people um, try to train themselves better than what we did, uh, I've seen God use that. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. So we knew from an early age of us praying together and Bible study together that God has a plan set out for us. We, we messed up. and. We're going to pay in for that mess up, but we can fix it and um, allow God to bless it and, you know, He can get the glory out of it. So she's always felt, and I have too, just she's a little more stronger in the faith than me, about that we're uh, called to mission work, we're called to be on mission, we're called into ministry. Sitting on a couch or sitting on a pew is not um, what the Christian faith is about. It's about getting out and sharing your faith, making disciples. So we knew from a young age going to camp um, that there was something different about us. I mean, what I was drawn to, she was a beautiful young girl, but she had, she was so strong in the Lord in her faith and her Bible study, and it just encouraged me. I was like, wow, wow, wow. And um, so I was so blessed to be around her. And then we let life happen, and uh, pride get in the way of we, money and things happen, and um, trying to fit in with everyone else and all the other families and do the things that they do and um, totally worldly yeah be how they were and it was a struggle for us to do that but we felt like we had to do that to fit in and be accepted and once you have children you understand how hard that is and they they stand out like a sore, th sore thumb whereas we're at home and we may be around our other employees and stuff like that but they're around their peers for many hours every day at school. And so if they don't fit in and if their parents don't let them go places and uh, say things and do things and they dress different, then they're ridiculed. And that's really hard. And they have to have much more support at home to compensate for that and be around other Christians and uh, a strong church family. And I think that's everything, you know, about our faith, we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to look different. We're supposed to talk different. Um, we're not supposed to look like everybody else, even though that's a struggle to want to be that, be like that. That's how the Lord's. We had the dream house, the dream rides. The, we had we had two homes. We had two really nice vehicles. We had two boats. We had two four wheelers. I had two kids. <laughs> we had the American dream, and we were serving in the church. Mm -hmm. We were paying our tithe. We were a deacon and youth pastor. We were working in the mm -hmm. church. We were serving in the church. We were on committees, mm -hmm. and we were just everything was evolved around the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, then slowly, my job started disappearing. We got pregnant again. Well, she had the baby, so she couldn't work anymore. So instead of two incomes, we have one. My job slowed down to probably thirty percent of what it was the year before, 
And then she decides, well, I need to go to school after the baby's old enough to start school. We'll let the baby go to school. So work just steadily slowed down, slowed down every year. It got worse and worse and worse in 2010. Um, the Lord was working on us the whole time, but we were feeling like we were being punished because all of the things that God has blessed us with were earthly things and was prideful things. And slowly, surely, we had to check ourselves. And I lost my job pretty much completely. It went from $100,000 a year to $15,000 a year. She wasn't working. We had to sell our house. We never missed a payment in 84 months and then we missed the last six of seven and we just sent them what we had some months it was a hundred dollars some months it was five hundred dollars some months it was fifty dollars so we paid one payment out of six months and they, they the bank says okay you need to leave the keys on the counter and we had uh, had friends and church members tell us well, you just need to file bankruptcy and we looked at each other and it's like i don't think that's honoring christ to file bankruptcy if we lose it we lose it it's our fault i did i built too much of a house. I didn't have a job that didn't know that the economy was going to stop. And and at this time, we were being obedient. We were we obedient. Were serving we were serving the church. the church. Everything was going well. We thought the right. Lord was blessing us with earthly things, which can be a blessing, but it gets in the way of um, spiritual things, of eternal things, things and that God truly doesn't, matter. God doesn't think like we do. We consider all the blessings that we have to be materialistic. And... We don't think of it as a blessing when he takes away things to grow us and to mature us. And regardless of how much we had or lost, uh, the spiritual side of it is so much more valuable. Completely. We don't have money. We're borrowing money from our parents to keep the, the lights on and the gas paid. And we have an opportunity to go on a mission trip. And she feels strongly about missions. And our daughter got the opportunity to go to Africa. So my wife's like, she's not going by herself. We have an 18-year-old daughter. She will not go in another country without me. So she said, I'm going with her. I was like, well, we'll scrape and scrounge. We asked for donations. We felt that this is what God is calling her to do. Our daughter's totally committed in it, so we're going to support her. So doing that, we're going to support you going. We were and borrowing money to pay the bills. And little did I know, that's how God We were losing me. our house, but we felt this is a necessity. We need to do this for some reason. So my wife was a normal, great wife. She took care of the kids. She loved the kids. She did vacation Bible school. She was invested in the church. And... She comes back from a mission trip totally selfless, totally broken from earthly things and material things and what she's wearing and those two-year-old shoes that have scuffs all over them didn't matter anymore. So she came back a changed woman, a blessing to me that, boy, we've got our focus all mixed up. Our, our idea of the American dream and God blessing us is all mixed up and messed up because there's people that don't have food every day. There's people that don't have clothes. There's people that don't have air conditioning and running water. They have to travel hours a day to get a pail of water to bring back just to uh, clean and cook. Nothing. Like literally nothing. And um, so God used that uh, to kind of break some of that pride. And we lost our home. We did not file bankruptcy, which I think was a blessing because if we would have listened to that, we would have filed bankruptcy, we would have kept our house, and God wouldn't have showed us where we were prideful. It's a huge stepping stone. So basically, we're facing foreclosure. We don't have two nickels ready to go. We're borrowing money from our parents to pay the utility bill and the gas bill and keep the house afloat so we can give it back to the bank. And the bank tells us, you've got to leave the keys on the counter. Then all of a sudden, a friend of mine calls, we can't sell socks in the summer or ice and ice in the winter socks in the winter <laughs> we cannot ice sell in the ice in the summer yeah. or socks in the winter we just can't sell we don't negotiate with people we just if we see something we want to buy they have a price we give them their price if we think it's worth it so we were debating on we were going to church about 20 minutes away we talked to the pastor the pastor said move into the youth building it's wide open no worries uh, nobody's using it it'll be great y'all can move in there temporarily y'all can pay rent if you want to if you have the money if you don't no worries so great the next day this was like on a Saturday or Sunday the deacons decide to give the church to a 
uh, black church down the street to let them use for their ministry. So that was a shut door that God decided to shut our door for us. So we're like, all right, Lord, where are we going? Because we've got 20 days to get out and we have nowhere to go. We trust in you and we believe in you, but we have nowhere to go. So then we talked to the deacons. Well, since we messed that up, why don't you move into the parsonage? Well, we said, great. The parsonage great. Nobody's living in the parsonage. We'll live there. We'll pay rent. Thank you, Lord. So the pastor... Um, had just talking to the people to tear the carpet, the floors out, the cabinets out, and start remodeling parsonage because parsonage no one was there. So that's door number two. We have nowhere to go. My mother is living in Memphis, Tennessee, an hour and a half away. So we're like, she's living in a one-bedroom apartment. Looks like we're going to be moving in with her. And we can't sell socks in the winter and ice in the summer. So what are we going to do? So we pray about it, and I have a huge truck with a huge note, and we need to sell my truck. We've got equity built up in the truck. I have a tractor. My daughter has two cars. We have a four-wheeler and guns and computers. Boat. In one week, in a boat, in a week, we sold my truck, my tractor, a four-wheeler, a computer, my daughter's second car. We ended up having not two nickels to rub together to having $26,000 and a friend at our old church saying, hey, my buddy's mom passed away about six months ago and she has a home for you to live in. And if I y'all want to move in, maybe they can work something out. We went from having $0 to $26,000 and $200 in one week. So that we talk to them, say, hey, we need a place to live. We have nowhere to go. We're probably going to move to Memphis. And the guy says, well, won't you meet me after church on Sunday? I, my mom will be tickled for someone to be living in her home because it's just sitting there. So that's where she comes in, where our pride had to take a hit. Yeah, we we pull up to the house, and it's in town, and we, we like living in the country. So that was the first negative aspect to it. And I'm, In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, we just came from a 300000 house, square foot house, and uh, my kids grew up in it. I don't want to move, and no telling what this house is going to look like. Who wants to live in a house that a woman died in? So I'm thinking about all of this, and we pull up to the house, and the windows are boarded up. It's an old wood house. Nobody's living there, and I have already made up my mind. We're not going to live here. We're not going to live here, and so we go into the house. I follow the man, and Richard's behind him, and we walk in. And you can't really see the living area when we walk in. But the house has been closed up. It's uh, hot outside, so it's real musty. And we walk in, they walk ahead, and I turn turn around to see uh, just rooms full of items. Well, in a room full of items, there's two things that stick out to me. There's a red couch and a red love seat. And God completely humbled me at that point. And you don't know this, but years before that, I had asked Richard for a red living room set. And he laughed. He was like, there's no way you're getting red furniture in our house. He said, we don't live in New York City, so that's not happening. We're doing neutral colors. So I just let it go. So sometimes I'm kind of hard-headed, and so God has to really make itself evident in my life for me to listen to him. Because I had made up a mind that was not our house. I don't care if it was for free. So I, I see these couches over there. And immediately I'm dropped to my knees. I think, this is it. Regardless if I hate it, this is how God's providing for us. And so him and the guy that's showing us the house proceed to walk down the hall and look at the other rooms. And I'm just sitting there waiting for them because I know it's our house. I don't know how we're going to get it, but it's going to be our house. And so... In a strange way, I had a peace that came over me at that time. Now, the man was asking much more than what we had. And so, I didn't even think about that. God had already told me this was going to be our house. So, we, we proceeded outside and we're standing around and talking. And oh, Richard asked the guy, he said, well, how much How much do you want for the house? And he said, well, I'm asking 40000 Richard said, well, we've got 25000 and $200. 26 to $26,000. And he said, I can give you $25,000 for the house. And I'm laughing because I just, I know in my heart, God's going to work it out somehow. I don't know um, if you're going to have to cut grass for the man for the next 10 years or what to make up the difference. So the guy looks down at the ground and takes what seemed like an eternity, like three or four minutes to even respond. He said, well, I guess that'll be okay. And 
just once again, God provided for us through his own means. And whereas we shouldn't have been able to get the house, he provided and that's what he wanted for us. And that growing process and humbling process has been very valuable in our mature Christian lives. Very good. <laughs> What's the verse that you always bring up about? Philippians 4.11. Philippians 4.11 and, mm -hmm. and much. Um, I'm content and then yeah, I, I can't remember, I can't quote it. But. Yeah, at that time, um, it was almost like a cloud in the sky and I saw it. Or Paul's talking about, I've had much and I was content. I've had little and I was content. And regardless of what we have, we should be content. He is enough. I am Richard Watkins. I am Suzanne Watkins. His, His grace, grace is, is enough. enough.